black holes. Here, more or less everything is clear. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. We obviously don't know a lot about them. But at least most scientists agree that they exist. White holes. Time reversal of black holes. Even though, just like black holes, they occur in some solutions of Einstein's equations, in reality, white holes probably cannot exist. Black holes made of light. What? As weird as it sounds, the idea might not be that crazy. Such an object, also known as Kugelblitz, which in German means ball lightning, can hypothetically exist. We could even create them if we had necessary technology and even use them, let's say, to power starships. I guess you may have a couple of questions, so let's try to answer them. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. Let me begin by saying that black holes made of light in a sense already exist, and scientists even create them in labs. But those are not the black holes you would normally think of. Those are analog black holes, but I won't talk only about those. What's the problem with black holes? They are really far away. And stellar black holes are also very small, only a couple of tens of kilometers in radius, so it's really hard to study them directly. We can get some indirect information, for instance, studying their interactions with material that surrounds them and also nearby objects. This way we can learn about properties of black holes themselves. And yet a lot of aspects of black holes, like Hawking radiation, are still a mystery. To learn more about black holes, scientists came up with the idea to create an analogous black hole in a laboratory. And I'm not talking about that situation with Large Hadron Collider, when media on multiple occasions reported that LHC would produce a tiny black hole that would destroy Earth. We need to create a system that would act like a black hole with the event horizon and all that, and without needing to actually crush matter into tiny volume to make an actual black hole. So if it acts in a similar way, perhaps it might tell us something about an actual black hole. For an actual black hole, an event horizon is a region in space at a certain distance from a black hole's center that defines an edge where space-time is curved in a way that, to escape, you would have to accelerate to faster than light speeds, which is, as far as we know, not possible. So in an analog black hole, there is somewhat similar behavior, but at way lower speeds. For instance, instead of the speed of light, there is speed of sound, and such system is much easier to create and study. Perhaps the most obvious examples are analogs of rotating black holes made with water. Something similar to an analog black hole you've probably seen in your own bathtub. So, so far that doesn't sound very scientific, and yet obviously actual models are more complicated than that. Strengths of water are directed in a way to create a vortex. Special dye, high-speed cameras and other equipment is used. But on a basic level, it's a very simple system. Analogous gravity made with water. Waves with a certain velocity are created. Far from vortex, they can move freely in any direction. But at a certain point, the speed inside the vortex is higher than the speed of waves. So it's reminiscent of an actual event horizon, but not with space-time and light, but rather with water. At the first glance, it might seem not very serious. And yet, analogous gravity actually does resemble the behavior of actual gravity and can be described with similar equations. This way you can study black hole superradiance, which first was described by Yakov Zeldovich. Waves or particles at the event horizon can gain some momentum from a rotating black hole. Also, using analog black hole, you could create analogous Hawking radiation. Stephen Hawking predicted that black holes are not quite black, they also radiate, and it is a quantum process known as Hawking radiation. For instance, scientists in a recent study described an experiment where they created analog black hole using 8000 atoms of rubidium. Atoms moved at supersonic speeds and authors detected an analog of Hawking radiation in the form of sound waves that escaped a sonic black hole. Analog black holes can also be created with Bose-Einstein condensate and, of course, light. There were experiments with a special kind of optic fiber. Very often, when someone says the speed of light, they also add in a vacuum. And that's no accident. We know that light gets refracted and reflected in some transparent medium, and it sort of slows down. So this property of light is used in such experiments to create an analog of an event horizon. So in a sense, it is a black hole made of light. Analog black hole. Anyway, even those were very interesting ways to study black holes, that doesn't mean that this is exactly how real black holes act, and it's up for debate 
how seriously we can treat conclusions of those experiments. But could there be actual black holes made of light? You could have heard of four types of black holes. Stellar mass black holes are formed when a massive enough star runs out of hydrogen to sustain thermonuclear fusion reactions in its core. Gravity wins over in a constant battle with the outward pressure, the core collapses, and a black hole forms. Of course, it's not the whole story. Is a black hole formed directly, or at first a short-lived neutron star forms? Also, a stellar black hole can form when two neutron stars merge. As for the supermassive black holes that are thought to exist in the center of most large galaxies, we don't really know how they form. It could be merging of less massive black holes or direct collapse in the early universe. There's also intermediate mass black holes. The least is known about those and only a couple candidates have been discovered so far. Finally, there are primordial black holes. This type for now is purely hypothetical. They could have formed at the earliest stages of the evolution of the universe and they could have a wide range of masses, from microscopic to thousands of solar masses. Roughly speaking, you could create a black hole from any mass if you squeeze it hard enough. For example, you can use Wolfram to calculate how much you would need to squeeze an object of a certain mass. Or what is Schwarzschild radius or gravitational radius? Basically, a distance at which you would find an event horizon. That's what is often referred to as the size of a black hole. For the Sun, it's about 3 kilometers or a little less than 2 miles. For Earth, it's less than a centimeter or less than a half an inch. And for an object with a mass of 100 kg, it is 1.485 times 10 to the minus 25 meters. Which is a lot smaller than a proton. We obviously don't have means to create actual black holes in this way. And natural mechanisms that we are aware of form stellar mass black holes. Okay, but so far I've been rambling about black holes, mass, matter, but what about light? This may sound counterintuitive. So we've heard that photons are massless. So if we don't have mass and to create a black hole we need, well, mass. So how can we make a black hole out of light? You might think of the mass and energy equivalence principle. Usually when someone is trying to explain it very briefly they say something like this. According to this principle mass and energy are equivalent. And those are different instances of the same thing. You may come to a conclusion that matter contains energy. And a small amount of matter has a lot of energy. This is what this famous equation tells us about. The energy of an object at rest equals mass times speed of light squared. In practice it's very effectively demonstrated with nuclear weapons. A lot of energy is released in fission reactions. And that's also just a fraction of the energy. So the light has energy. If mass and energy are equivalent, if we concentrate a lot of light, hence energy, in a tiny volume of space, space can get curved the event horizon would form and we would get an actual black hole. And after the event horizon is formed, the question of what a black hole initially was made of becomes irrelevant. The black hole will look the same no matter what made it. That's in short and without a lot of details, and there's a lot of those. Now we won't go into too much detail, I'm not gonna talk about what mass actually is, how it's related to the movement of subatomic particles, relativistic and rest mass, and all that. But I will try to give you a couple of examples of how that might work and not just say mass and energy are equivalent. In spite of the fact that the mass of the photon is thought to be zero, what we call gravity also affects massless particles or waves. We know that massive objects curve space-time, basically what we call gravity. And that affects not only other massive objects, but light as well. That alters trajectories that light travels. It's proven in experiments and we see multiple examples of that. For instance, in the form of gravitational lensing. A massive galaxy or a galaxy cluster, similar to an optical lens, distorts or multiplies an image of an object that is farther away. So we can see effects of gravity or space-time curvature both on massive objects as it defines their movement in space, and on light, which is supposed to not have mass. There is another link between mass and light. You might think that if an object radiates, it might gradually lose mass because it loses energy in the form of photons. Let's look at our Sun. It constantly, though very, very slowly, loses mass due to coronal mass ejections and solar wind, but also because of solar radiation, light of different wavelengths. Let's get back to the mass-energy equivalence. 
Another conclusion someone could make is that photons don't have mass, perhaps they don't have energy as well, but how can that be? We use energy of light in some form all of the time. The thing is that E equals mc squared is not the whole story. I mentioned the object at rest for a reason. There is also this form. If the object is moving, it has momentum. In classical physics, momentum equals mass times velocity. This can be demonstrated with a very scientific method. With pain. If you throw a little ball at me at a very high velocity... Ow! I felt this much pain. Yeah, and I could feel the same level of pain if you threw at me a more massive object, but slower. But if we increase both mass and velocity, uh, we won't do that. You get the point. So let's get back to this equation. If the object has mass, but it is at rest, then momentum is zero and this part goes away and what is left is this familiar equation. Light cannot be at rest. We know that the speed of light is the same for any observer. It is always moving. But in this case, mass is zero, so this part has to go away, and what is left is this. The light has momentum, hence energy. And again, that momentum is not only in equations. This makes something like light sail possible. When radiation transfers momentum to the sail, it basically pushes in a similar way to the wind that pushes on a regular sail on a boat. Right now, there is a spacecraft called Light Sail 2 in orbit that successfully demonstrates that effect. To sum up, light doesn't have mass, but it does have momentum and energy. And general relativity predicts that light can curve space-time like massive objects do. So not only light is affected by gravity, it can also act in a similar way itself. The influence is tiny, and perhaps in the modern universe it doesn't have any significant effect on astronomical objects. That's why to create a black hole out of light you need to concentrate a lot. A lot of light in a tiny space. We don't exactly know how much light we would need to create a Kugelblitz. I've already said that a small amount of mass contains a lot of energy. So if we want to use radiation to create a black hole, we need a lot of it. It's quite hard to comprehend how much light we would have to cram into one spot to create a large black hole. But something smaller? Theoretically, we could build a gamma ray laser, supply it, let's say, with a year's worth of sun's energy and point it in a tiny spot. This concentration of energy could create an event horizon or a microscopic black hole. We could use even less energy equivalent to what the sun produces in a day or even a fraction of a second, but the resulting black hole would be less massive and with a size way smaller than a proton. At least it doesn't seem completely impossible. But there is a little caveat. If we concentrate so much energy in such a tiny space, it would lead to a lot of heat. It may become as high as Planck temperature and that is 142 million 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 degrees. Laws of physics that we know of can start to break down. This could create conditions similar to those of the first moments after the Big Bang. We don't quite understand what could happen there. Who knows, maybe we would need even less energy. But at least it is theoretically possible to create black holes this way. And there are even scientific articles about using such artificially made black holes for interstellar travel. So it describes the possibility of building starships that would use black holes. Yes, it begins to sound like sci-fi and yet it's not impossible in principle. Create a microscopic black hole with a gamma ray laser and then extract energy from it via Hawking radiation. The temperature of that radiation depends on a black hole's mass. Actual astrophysical black hole's radiation is so weak, weaker than the cosmic microwave background, so we probably will never be able to detect it directly. The smaller a black hole, the stronger its Hawking radiation and the faster it evaporates. In this article there are some estimates. A black hole with a radius of one atometer, or one quintillionth of a meter, it would completely evaporate in five years, and during that time it would produce 129 petawatts or 129 billion million watts. The idea is to use a Dyson sphere to harvest energy from the black hole. Usually hypothetical Dyson spheres are described as structures that could be used to harvest energy of whole stars, but the same principle could be applied to a microscopic black hole and its Hawking radiation. In the best case scenario, such a starship powered by a black hole could accelerate to 72% of speed of light. 
which would make travel to nearest stars at least viable, but of course there is a lot more to that than just speed. Obviously no one is going to build such a ship in the nearest future. We don't have a technology for that and it's hard to tell if we ever will. We would need to build the laser, get those crazy amounts of energy. We don't know how to build a ship so it would hold a black hole and so on and so forth. And also we're not sure how this much energy would behave in a space that tiny. So for now, actual interstellar travel is more of a science fiction, or at least it's in a very distant future. What is interesting is that the method I've just described doesn't require any new physics, and it is basically just limited by lack of technology. So at least it's not the worst idea for interstellar travel in the far future. Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description, and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye.